welcome to the panel on exchange traded fund managed portfolios. I'll be the panel's moderator. My name is Brendan Conway, uh, and I'm a writer for Barron's. Uh, today we have a great group of experts on this subject for you. To my left right here is Michael Kane, who's the CEO and CIO of Hedgeable. We've got Michael Rodoff, who's the CEO of Market Realist. And then finally on the far side, we've got Bill Smalley, who's the president of ETF Issuer Solutions. What we're dealing with here is a relatively new structure in the history of the security markets, the exchange traded fund. Why don't we just start it off, guys, really broadly. Why are ETFs so popular? They've been growing at a rate of about 25% a year for something like a decade. What is it about this structure that is inviting so many new investors? Uh, Mike, do you want to kick that off? Yeah, well, I think generally the ability to manage markets has really brought about the rise of ETFs. So traditionally, 30, 40 years ago, you would have to have bought future contracts. There's great uh, problems with that kind of exposure, derivatives markets. Let's say I wanted to buy Japan, or I wanted to buy uh, Brazil, or I wanted to buy gold. Um, this was really the only way to do it. Now, with the click of a button, I could get exposure to gold, to Japan, to China. And then two days from now, I could decide I want to sell out of those positions with the click of a button. So I really think uh, the financial crisis has greatly increased the use and need for ETFs. Uh, the stock picking era is kind of over because people saw that during that time all the markets were highly correlated. The correlations went to one. Uh, there was really no need to, to pick stocks. You had to be able to cut risk, uh, which is essentially what we do at Hedgeable. You know, we tactically move out of markets um, and into markets that are, are doing uh, are going to outperform in the future um, to you know cut down on this underperformance like you saw in, in the financial crisis. So. Okay, I think so it's really the, the, the meat of it. Um, you know, was this need to be more tactical, to be able to trade in and out of markets quickly. Okay, so several different issues there about the structure, about things that are required by the financial crisis, about the type of exposure. Um, guys, you know, do you find any of those explanations more convincing than another, or would you like to ask, uh, add another one? Sure. Um, you know, I would say that the ETF is a structurally superior vehicle. Uh, especially with respect to uh, 40 Act open end mutual funds, um, I think what's lost in the coverage of the explosive growths of, uh, of exchange traded funds in the last 10 years is that it took a massive educational effort uh, from the early entrance so in the, uh, into the into the space in the 90s and early 2000s, just to get uh, you know the, the industry to the point that it could be positioned to grow into the two trillion dollar plus market that it is today. Um, that said. Uh, structurally, you know, ETFs are low-cost vehicles. They're transparent. They're liquid relative to their, you know, sort of mutual fund cousins, and they're frankly easy to use. They can be bought and sold like stocks, and it has sort of spawned a, a new, a new way of uh, managing risk. Sort of uh, what, what Mike's talking about on, you know, tactical asset management. Would you also credit tax efficiency? Would you throw that in the? I, I that 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 to me is one of the ones that I think the end user. It cares about the most that, that, that maybe it's easy to forget about. Michael, anything to add? I, I think in my view, um, financial advisors love the flexibility and the easiness of using ETFs. You don't need to pick a basket of stocks, which can take a lot of time when an investor is looking to make an asset allocation. I think the low fee structure is really critically important um, for investors. I think the tax efficiency is also incredibly important. Um, and um, it, it really allows um, retail investors, I think, to access, um, to be able to invest very easily in a way that they just couldn't do before, in a way that's a lot less risky. Okay. So we've got three fans here of exchange traded funds. You guys obviously really like this structure. Let's take it a step further now and talk about managed portfolios of ETFs. These things are growing like gangbusters. The Morningstar number was something like 80% growth in 2013. Uh, might be getting that number off a little bit, but you know, a lot of advisors are moving to this structure, maybe instead of mutual funds, in place of them, or maybe to complement them. What is it about this trend that is causing the asset growth to be so strong? Well, I think this is all part of the larger trend of uh, money moving out of mutual funds and into more liquid products. So I think this is just part of a broader trend in the market. Um, but it was really because of the financial crisis that you know it's just so easy now for us as a a strategist to structure all kinds of products and attack all these different markets where we 
before we would have to have purchased a million stocks um, or invest in outside mutual funds. The problem with doing that, as we all know, is you know, guys have been get, getting away with murder for years. Um, when you say murder, what are you referring to exactly? So they, they, traditionally, a separate account market was, we're going to go pick uh, third-party mutual funds, active mutual funds, and we're going to charge on top of that. We're going to charge 100 basis points, 200 basis points, on top of the mutual fund fee. So it's essentially like a fund of funds model in the hedge fund space. Uh, but these people that were structuring the portfolios don't actually do anything. They don't manage any money. They're allocating to other mutual funds. So that now you have two layers of fees. Not only that, you're now investing in a mutual fund which has its own issues. Where you know, firms like ours are cutting away all of those middlemen. It's one fee, it's low fee, it's highly liquid, and we can invest in any market that we want to. So, okay. so what you're pointing to really is two sets of fee compressions, right? The fees in the underlying instrument right. and the fees of the, the bundler. Right. What else is going on with this trend, you guys? I mean, it's so rapid. I, I, think, I think there are a few components to this. Um, we, in, the, in the early 2000s, what you've seen is enormous amount of sensational financial media coverage of hit stocks, um, incredible opportunities, and then in 2008, many investors lost their pants. And you can't ever find a more loyal passive investor than a failed active investor. If you look at the performance of hedge funds, 83% of hedge funds, these are amongst the most sophisticated investors, underperform their benchmarks after fees. So if you think about it, you're much more likely to be successful with a passive strategy. More investors are becoming educated about that. More investors are experienced. And as you see more pension funds in particular and financial advisors begin to offer ETFs to their clients and to their employees, you'll continue to see more adoption. We think that the ultimate trend ultimately is you'll see ETFs surpass 10 trillion in assets. And it's only a matter of time before that happens. And how, how long do you think that will take? Who knows? So wh where are those? Where, where, <laughs> We're not in the market uh, timing business. Where, where are those assets going to come from? Are they going to come from you know mutual funds? Are these going to be you know new entrants into the market? I mean, these are the things that we think about. Um, you know, is there education that needs to go along with this to ad advisors that hey, you shouldn't be investing in these mutual fund portfolios anymore? Here's ETFs. Here's why they're superior. So. Across asset classes, in general, you'll see that ETFs are superior. In some cases, mutual funds might actually be a better selection. I think what's important from a market realist perspective, and we're, although we're, we're actually the leading provider of ETF research, we also cover MLPs and REITs and global equities, and we're continuing to grow coverage. So we do about 900 research pieces a month. And what we try to do is think about this from more of an asset allocation question and less from a specific fund selection question. So um, the default position is to have lower fees. And by default, you're often going to choose an ETF. And in fact, if you're thinking about stocks, if you don't have an incredibly sh strong conviction in a particular stock, um, and that stock in particular might be a large cap, you might be better off actually investing in the ETF because 70% of most large cap returns come from the industry. And frankly, more of the returns come from the macro environment, and that's what ETFs track. So I think as investors become more educated around what the drivers of valuations are, you'll, you'll continue to see more adoption of ETFs. Yeah, I think just in general, the whole market has become more global macro. And we see this with you know, how our markets are moved now. It's Fed policy. That's the only thing that people look at now uh, in, from our perspective. They look at Fed policy. That moves markets for years where that wasn't the case um, you know, in a few decades uh, in the past. Um, so everybody's become a global macro. Ray Dalio, George Soros kind of manager. Um, and Going with that trend is ETFs allow you, uh, allow firms like ours to basically build a global macro portfolio, but with no illiquidity, no leverage, no shorting, uh, and we don't charge two and 20 fees, so. Okay, so. Essentially some of the same benefits that ETFs actually offer, the managed ETF portfolio kind of reflects the transparency, the fee structure, um, you know, the, uh, um, the, the sort of rules-based, um, you know, access to a particular market. And th I actually, you know, kind of contrary to your point earlier, I, I think that um, the managed ETF portfolio is a sort of bridge between passive and active management. On the one hand, they're using index-based tools primarily, especially tactical managers. Uh, but on the other, it's, you know, the alpha is coming from the manager's selection, basically how they're deploying the assets using these tools. So I think it's an interesting uh, sort of middle ground between kind of classic 
active management and just pure index-based uh, investment. Bill, you, you actually just hit on a point I was hoping to ask about, which is, in your opinion, do you think it's easier to trust a managed portfolio when you can see what it's basically trading every day through, through, through your, you know, you, you call them up or you, you get an email, you see their account. If I buy a 40 act mutual fund, often, oftentimes I have to trust that manager. I have to believe that he's in control of his process. Is this a little bit easier to kick the tires on? Is that part of this trend? Definitely. Um, not only can you see what the manager is holding, the fund that the manager is holding, but if you really wanted to, you could dig into the ETF's underlying holdings to write, you know, get down to the brass tacks. Um, that said, a lot of you know a lot of ETF uh, you know model managers are very good at uh, educating their clients um, using the internet, truthfully, um, and not only describing their investment philosophy, but how they're actually going about uh, deploying their clients' money. Yeah. It's just so much more transparent. Um, so, for instance, uh, platforms like Investnet and these TAM platforms, and we provide a platform as well at Hedgeable. We'll, we'll show our clients live all of your holdings, all the underlying risk, performance information, any statistic you want live. So you don't have to wait until the, the end of the quarter um, or the end of the day to, to get a nav. You know, everything's just so much more transparent. There's so much more technology now um, uh, from the advisor's perspective especially. There's all these platforms. If you're on a wirehouse platform, they provide all these tools and analytics. Um, so it's just the transparency transparency in the market, uh, and this really got back to the whole Bernie Madoff uh, scandal. Uh, this is what people are looking for. They, they want to know what they're holding all yeah. the time, and uh, they don't want to wait until the, the end of the month to get a call and say, hey, your, your account was down 5%. Uh, they they want to know and everything, and, and every manager now is doing this, giving more education. Yeah. Is, let me just ask too, is, is sort of one of the keys to understanding how, how these things work is on the one hand, yes, you do have these passive instruments and we all love passive investing, amen, passive investing, but some of these strategies, when I look at them, I can't, I can barely think of a strategy that's more active but, but is also not destructive. I mean, some of these managers are very, very active, aren't they? I think it, it really depends on, on the strategy. So. Uh, you, know, you know, in this market, you, you have people that are targeting different parts. So you have some that are going after more long-term 401k IRA assets like, like Hedgeable. Um, so we're, we're not very active. Mm -hmm. We do about one trade a month across our 30 strategies. So we're looking at long-term trends in, in, ma in markets. You have some other managers that are targeting more sophisticated high net worth investors, more taxable accounts. There's going to be more turnover. Um, there, there are more niche products. Uh, they're doing some more, much more so in sophisticated markets. So I, I don't think there's a, a blanket you could put over all of the managers. It's really like any other space, mutual fund or hedge fund. It, it depends on who they're targeting, what the strategy is. Mm -hmm. Mike, you had some thoughts. I, I think that to get a good grasp on this, you need to understand some of the high level themes. And uh, these apply not just to ETFs, but the overall industry. You see enormous fee compression compression, not just for ETFs, but in mutual fund space and the advisory space, you see greater attempts towards transparency. So if you speak to advisors, often they quote now your all-in expense ratio, which I don't think occurred 10 years ago. And as you see um, these trends impacting multiple asset classes, ultimately what you're seeing is fewer and fewer differences between mutual funds and ETFs and other assets as well. Um, as mutual funds move to lower fees and some ETFs become more active, whereas you would have thought of an ETF five or 10 years ago solely as a passive instrument. So uh, what you're really thinking about now is um, you need to select the right vehicle. It should have low fees I, and reasonable fees, I, but I, it should accomplish, most importantly, your strategy. I think another interesting thing, and, yes. and I think Bill could probably speak to uh, this more eloquently than me, but. Now, is there a room for a managed ETF portfolio of an active uh, ETF basket? So we have active ETF providers, so they're managing the money. It's the same thing we we're talking about the mutual funds. So basically, they're like, they're like a fund of funds. You know, is there room for that, or, or should people looking, be looking at that? Absolutely. You know, um, you know, going back to what you said earlier, it's really hard to you know, make a sort of blanket statement about uh, that, that can describe all of the, uh, you know, the entire uh, managed ETF portfolio space. Some very tactical and aggressive in nature, 
fact, some tactical managers have three or four or five flavors, uh, depending on how aggressive their clients want to be. Uh, and then on the other, you know, the flip side is that you have uh, strategic asset allocators who uh, probably espouse uh, a little bit of what Hedgeable is looking to do, uh, you know, less turnover, uh, more broad diversification. Um, that said, there's not a lot of alternative uh, focused manage ETF portfolios. In fact, there's you know, approximately 200 uh, uh, managers in the space right now representing something like $100 billion in AUM in the U.S. And uh, to my knowledge, there's not one that has a sp specific focus on alternatives. When you say alternatives, you mean like a, a 130-30 strategy or uh, just a commodity uh, strategy or a just CTA. seeking a, a, a low or near zero uh, correlation. You know something that uh, that a hedge fund might uh, might might target in their sort of investment thesis to uh, to their to their prospective clients. No, I think why, why why is there a lack of those strategies? Is it a lack of kind of the underlying building blocks to make them with? Could be could be that um, you know there are frankly very few uh, sophisticated alternative uh, ETFs right now. Uh, that's an area of growth that uh, at ETFIS you know we uh, we see that happening in the next uh, you know one to one to five years. Um, so as more tools are brought to market, uh, these managers, ha frankly, have uh, you know more viable options to to manage their clients' money. Now that said, um, you got to remember that the managed ETF portfolio sp space basically didn't exist five years ago. So um, it's just obvious that they're more stock and bond oriented for now. I think it's just a natural sort of phase two that uh, it gets even more sophisticated, gets into alternatives a little bit. Um, I think that's going to happen as well. I think there's a way to kind of think about things differently, and this is how really how we think about it at Hedgeable. Uh, wh why have an alternative uh, strategy? Why not manage assets alternatively? Uh, that's the way we think about things. So why not manage a large cap and a diversified portfolio, but instead of doing it in the same old way, modern portfolio theory, more passive, apply more al alternative techniques to those broad market strategies. So you have a low correlation, you have the downside protection, uh, you're seeking alpha, um, pardon the, the pun, and, and Mike used to work at seeking alpha. Uh, so you, you have all those attributes that you look for in a alternative manager, but it's not an alternative strategy. Yeah, when I say alternative, I'm speaking very broadly, right? You have alternative assets, but you also have alternative management, which I think is you know what, right. what you're getting at. How do you do that, Mike? I mean, I mean, it's one thing to say manage alternatively, but what, what does that really look like? Right. So I, I, I worked at Bridgewater, which is now the largest, most well-known alternative guy. So there they managed all these complex instruments because uh, they're in oil markets and natural gas markets and doing uh, inflation-linked bonds, you know, very complicated things. Uh, so obviously we're not going to do that with uh, ETFs. So what we do is we try to take some of those same techniques that big global macro guys use, so more tactical asset allocation on a very high level. So really all that is is we're moving out of parts of the market that are underperforming. So you know, why be exposed to SPY, uh, the big S&P 500 ETF, when the market's going down? So if the market's in a large drawdown, what a big hedge fund would do is they would put on a uh, you know, short futures position on uh, S&P. So you know, we're not going to do that because uh, we have a very liquid, you know, broad portfolio. Um, but we'll cut our exposure, so we'll, we'll be in cash. So we might have 50% in cash. And that's where you get the, the lower beta, the lower correlation, because you know, markets are most volatile when they're going down. That's when you see the most volatility in, in any market. Uh, they're most risky when those drawdowns are happening. So if we could cut down the drawdowns, like the big global macro guys do, and then capture most of the upside, um, you know, this is basic tactical asset allocation, um, but it's only available available to us now because we have ETFs. Okay. We, we couldn't do this without ETFs. It's okay. just not possible. So the, the, the key for the end user is to get your model, to like your model, and to like your approach. Um, that's what it means to manage alternatively. Well, I think in general, I, the, the whole market's moving. When I say the market, the, the end users, they, they don't want beta. Uh, and that's across the board at any product. No one wants to get a beta product, because they could go to Vanguard and do that for five basis points. So no one wants to pay you 100 basis points, 200 basis points, um, or in our case, 50 basis points for, for beta. Um, they want something that's more dynamic, more tactical. You're able to be more nimble. Um, and any advisor will tell you this, that 
they want to miss out on the large drawdowns in markets. That's the number one thing that clients want. And they're usually willing want. to give up some upside in right. the kind of market environment that we've been in the last you know, yeah. year, year and a half. You know, right. We're talking about long market cycles. So over a long market cycle, which is where most advisors and wealth managers are allocating money, they want to miss out on that downside and then capture most of the upside. Uh, then you have much smoother growth over the long term and then they don't lose assets. Um, so you'll see most mutual funds and uh, separate account managers who have large drawdowns, they're, they're done. People take all of their money out of the, there because if you have a 50% drawdown, now you need a 100% return just to get back even. Mm -hmm. If you have a 10% loss in the portfolio, it's a much, much smaller amount. So well, now the goal is not trying to beat the market, it's trying to preserve wealth. Very right. different, uh, very different goals. And it also you know, sort of speaks to uh, baby boomers getting older, truthfully, um, you know, uh, they're getting less aggressive as they get older, as they should, especially in a low income environment. Um, and that's, that's exactly, uh, I think, the reason why, uh, you know, managed ETF portfolios are where they are now. I think it'll take uh, another step, uh, another step to kind of target more of the millennials who may be more uh, aggressive in, in what they're looking for in, in, in an investment. Um, you know, that's probably some of the stuff that Hedgeable's working on as well, I'd imagine. Yeah, but this is all part of a change in mindset, right? So mm. it, it's more of an alternative mindset. You know, people are thinking uh, about the market like a, a global macro big you know, hedge fund shop would have. And these terms wouldn't have been passed around in a panel like this five years ago. People wouldn't have been talking about correlation and drawdowns and valued risk and tactical asset management. Uh, it's just things people didn't understand, but now they know to look at these things when they're evaluating a manager. Like, what is the max drawdown? If it's 60%, I'm definitely not going to invest in that manager. Mm -hmm. And that's just something that's, they wouldn't have looked at a few years ago. So we, we've, been, we've been through a couple of different types of the strategies that investors are going to encounter here. Um, let's, let's, let's try to quickly run through the other ones. And also, let's talk a little bit about the types of ETFs that you guys think tend to work best in these portfolios. Just, just this week, in fact, we, uh, we, we, we had an example, Good Harbor, one of the most successful managers, they were in the market, and you see that those guys are using leveraged ETFs, which, you know, to me, for my kind of Joe, Joe Investor knitting, I tell my readers, it's generally a bad idea to hold a leveraged ETF for more than a short period, and if you're using them, you really should know what you're doing. Uh, but it does seem as though there's a wide range of types of ETFs that are being used. Let's try to run quickly through the types of strategies, um, and then we'll get into the ETFs. Bill, you could probably to talk about this. Kick it off. Best. Sure. Uh, you know, I think you know, in the case of um, Good Harbor, um, probably the largest tactical uh, manager you know, in, in the space, uh, Good Harbor you know, can and, and, and does use um, leveraged ETFs in part because they have a relatively short-term uh, you know, when they're putting a position on, uh, it's potentially only for a month. Uh, in fact, some of the reason why you know they're uh, they've been in the news recently is because they're uh, you know they're now sufficiently large that when they're in and out in a leveraged ETF, let's say, or even a, a relatively large you know, small cap ETF, um, you know they're moving around uh, a lot of a lot of money and could potentially push the market. Um, so that said, for every good harbor, um, you know maybe we should take. A Take a step back. You know, broadly, you can kind of bifurcate the managed ETF uh, portfolio space into two categories. I think you have your tactical asset allocators, like the Good Harbors of the world, and you have your strategic asset allocators, who are um, who are less frequent and probably less risk averse, frankly, and truthfully uh, would not be using uh, tools like you know leveraged small cap ETFs. Mm -hmm. um, so, while they're very different, depending on how large they are, they need large and liquid ETFs. So. Uh, the most common ETFs used, I mean, truthfully, are you know the, the 10 to 20 largest ETFs. It's kind of no different than uh, how an institutional investor in a hedge fund might potentially use uh, uh, you know, a portfolio of ETFs. Yeah, that's how we think about structuring products. You know, if we were to manage $100 billion in this strategy, what would it need to hold? And I think that's important. A lot of people, when they're structuring these products, they, they don't look in the future. They say, now with my $20 million in assets under management, what can I do to get the best returns? But is that scalable? So we'll look at typically the top 10 to 15 ETFs in terms of assets, liquidity, SPY, EFA, GLD, AGG, et cetera. So broad markets in a more niche strategy. So we hold like a commodity 
uh, strategy we offer with ETF, ETFs. Um, we just wouldn't let that strategy get up to a certain point. We would never manage $10 billion in that because we would hold a, almost 100% of all these the ETFs market cap. Um, so I think uh, some of this just comes with experience and you know, building products at other firms, looking how other large firms have structured things like BlackRock. What you don't want to happen is to become, you know, hedgeable to become like American funds. So these things just get huge and you're paying them 1%. And what are you getting? You're getting S&P 500 exposure. So instead of when they were at a billion dollars, they could have owned 20 securities. Now that they're at 50 billion, they have to own 498 of the S&P 500 because otherwise they would just move all the stocks. What I wonder is because they're so large now, some of the bigger players, um, are they missing out on opportunities using you know, newer or a smaller ETFs that frankly don't have the liqui liquidity characteristics that they might typically look for given their size? I think that's you know, for every good harbor in, you know, in excess of $10 billion, you have 10 managers that run $100 million where moving in and out of two to five million in a, in a smaller ETF has no impact at all on, on, on the underliers. So I wonder, um, I, w I wonder where where we're going, um, you know, with, with smaller players, how how their returns are going to stack up with, say, the Good Harbors and the F Squareds of the world. Stack up meaning you think that they will be better or worse or? Well, they're 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 different. They have the ability to go in and into There's ETFs less that Good Harbor cannot. Less constraints. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So. Whether or not it outperforms or underperforms remains to be seen, but I think you're going to see um, you're going to see some com you know even though they may have tactical strategies, they might be doing completely different things in completely different names just given their size. Well, it's like an emerging mar uh, manager portfolio. You'll see a lot of uh, funds or advisors will will have these, and they'll say our our research shows that an emerging manager outperforms a more established manager, and it's for some of these reasons that. They're able to be more nimble. They could use any security that they want. They don't have as many investors to talk to. It's not as big of an operation. Um, you know, once you have thousands and thousands of clients, you need a technology platform, which most of these guys just don't have. They, they just don't think about that. Their guys are good at, good at managing money. They don't think, I need to build Bridgewater. I need to build Hedgeable. You know, Bridgewater and Hedgeable, we have hundreds of technology systems. No one sees them. They just see the end product, which is the managed money, but you need to have all this in the back end or else everything just unravels. And the irony is that the largest okay. managers are continuing to get the lion's share of new assets. So at what point do we hit, uh, you know, do we hit a saturation point with larger managers where it just makes sense uh, from an inv a, a new investor perspective to go, uh, go with the smaller guy who truthfully, as you said, uh, outperforms? It's a yeah. tough decision. Mike, thoughts on the technology issue? Yes, um, I think I think the best way to answer this is by answering the second half of your question first, which was which categories of ETFs um, have the most interest. So you generally see more interest um, from our experience in either plain vanilla funds, so the SPYs of the world, the VWOs of the world, or you see interest in very niche, interesting kind of tactical ETFs. Um, as an example, we had a piece a couple of months ago on Turkey, and it was a very low PE during the political crisis, and. Uh, the ETF's been up about 22% since we published that piece. And that's the sort of opportunity that a hedgeable might uh, potentially try to identify. And when you think about what the use case is for these two categories of ETFs, when you look at the plain vanilla fund, um, you sometimes see, ironically enough, hedge funds invested 10% plus of their portfolios in SPY. And you ask, why am I paying two and 20? for you to pay another expense ratio to invest in SPY? And the answer, there's a good answer to that question. The answer is, we don't have, um, we don't have an investment idea at the time for that capital, but we don't want to get hit by cash drag, which is why we're invested in SPY. And that, that kind of makes sense. Now, you asked that question about the second category, and the second category is this tactical stuff. And why are you financial advisor who's supposed to be responsible for asset allocation? And maybe I'm your customer because you're going to hook me up with cash margin or help my kids get into the right school, but your your job is asset allocation. Why is 10% of your portfolio with 
a hedgeable or another portfolio manager? And, and the answer to that question often is, you know, I have an allocation that I have a lot of conviction around. And these are funds that are really set aside for a tactical allocation, like, like that Turkey investment I mentioned. And because I don't have a view in that yet, but there are folks who are spending a lot of time figuring out that view, I'm going to allocate those funds to this group or that group and that group. And that's going to work out a lot better for you. That's not a permanent allocation, but as you see uh, more tactical allocation or you see more macro-oriented allocation, by macro, obviously Turkey is a macro allocation, but it's not this sort of wide-ranging emerging markets sort of allocation. You'll, you'll, you'll continue to see just that market grow, and um, you can't invest 10 billion, I don't even know if you can invest $100 billion in Turkey through an ETF. I don't think you can due to the liquidity issues, but I think you'll start to see a lot of the country-specific ETFs, and frankly, a lot of the industry-specific ETFs grow as, 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 that, uh, as that overall interest grows. I think, yeah, to Mike's point, I don't know that the leveraged ETFs themselves, you know, these, all these products get a bad rap. I don't think that's the problem. It's really structurally, you know, if they're a more niche product, how does that fit into a larger portfolio? So if it's a niche product, whether it's a leverage or a turkey, you have to think about what's the most money I could invest and buy at one time in this product. And then think when you're structuring a portfolio, maybe this needs to be a $100 million portfolio and you should be perfectly fine with that. Oh, sorry, but to correct that, that was not a leveraged um, ETF. No, right, that was right. just, uh, you know, I, I actually agree with you, Brandon. I think most lever leveraged ETFs are just bad. Like retail investors shouldn't be looking at them. It's a really easy way to lose money. Um, I think it's a lot of the mistakes. Um, if you're a retail investor, you shouldn't be investing in small caps. Just. You're not. That's your point of view, no small caps. No small caps, yeah. You could invest in maybe one small cap if it's something that, that you're very familiar with. small caps are down this year? No, more than no. The rest so of the we, we have our principles on the site, and one of the principles is don't invest in small caps, and it's also don't take on a lot of leverage. And there are other, other things, don't invest in Forex. And the reason we take those positions, and we've taken those positions years ago before small caps went down, is simply because these are assets that retail investors can't really get their arms around really well. And even a lot of professional investors, I don't think, don't do a good job understanding. So if you're gonna take positions in the market, you're better off participating in the sorts of investments that are more likely to make money than are less likely to make money. And if you look at the characteristics of many of these leverage loan funds, um, you know, they don't make that much money going up, but they make a heck of a lot, lose a lot more money going down. You said le le leverage loan, for you, 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 mean, you mean you mean the fund that's leveraged. You said leverage loan, but you I'm mean, sorry, leverage you funds. Mean leverage, right? Some leverage loan okay. funds are, that's a, that's a different story yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah. What's the, so so what's, the, what's the logic for small caps? I mean, you, you just don't view it as a favorable risk reward? Well, no, small caps might be a great opportunity through an ETF vehicle, but to actually pick out individual small caps. I see what you're saying. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. So you don't mean no investing in a broad small cap Well, no, index. I mean, it, theoretically, small caps as an index index fund would in the long term outperform maybe a large cap fund. And I think that's historically yeah. at I least mean, from a correct. Asset management perspective, if clients want small cap exposure, we have a small cap exposure for them. Yes. Yes. Inherently, small caps are riskier than large caps and bonds or really anything else besides emer emerging markets. But if they're going into that and say, I want small cap exposure, we're going to provide them a better small cap exposure product. So I think it's an important distinction there. Okay. Well, let's let's sort of come back to an issue you guys have all hit on about several times throughout this discussion, which is really twofold. One is, you know, what 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 kind of strategies do you think the Main Street investor really wants? One thing that you guys have all been hitting on is, um, you know, we don't want the giant. Sort of, sort of downdraft. We don't want to be hit by another financial crisis because it takes so much to sort of get back to that. And part B of this question would be, this is a fast growing area. We've talked about Good Harbor. There are other companies. It seems as though there are growing pains. So what do you do when you do encounter the strategy that you think you love, but you still have to do some due diligence on that manager? So let's start off by just talking about what are the strategies you think people really need? I think the, the biggest need is, if you look at like the 401k space, the big gorilla there is the target date funds. So it's $400 billion, some massive number, they're actually defaulted. So if you get into a 401k plan, you don't pick anything. You're going to get defaulted into Vanguard's target date. And frankly, these are not good products because they, they're pitching to clients and there's every 401k investor in them. So 75 million people potentially are in these products. 
Um, they give you broad market exposure. And it's just a scheme for them to keep your money over a long time. Because they say, oh, 10 years from now, we're going to cut down your risk. Well, what happens a year from now if the market goes down 50%? Why am I 100% in, in US equity? Why am I waiting 10 years? And paying you 100 basis points to do that 10 years from now. So I think that's really where the need is. So these are broad you know, asset allocation based products. So you would argue that, that those funds are too mechanical and they're not nimble enough yeah, they, I mean, they, they make, no, they make no sense. They should be free products. You shouldn't be charging to essentially stick people in the market. Uh, you know, we view things more tactically. So you know, move out of parts of the market that are doing poorly to cut down risk. You, know, you shouldn't have a 30% drawdown in an IRA or 401k account. It just shouldn't happen. There's no need for it. Because um, now you have someone who wanted to retire when they were 55. Now they have to retire when they're 75. And not only that, they paid Vanguard and T. Rowe Price to delay their retirement 20 years. So uh, from our perspective, the, the more broad uh, asset allocation based products is really the biggest need. You know, there's some smaller parts of the market that are more niche that are going to get very large. But if you look at the guys that have gotten the, the largest, like F Squared, Good Harbor, uh, Inialta, Windhaven, who uh, Schwab purchased, if you look at their products, they're not niche products. These are large cap, uh, aggressive uh, e you know, ETF portfolio, asset allocation based models. Well, one area which we haven't discussed yet is income funds. I think there's an enormous growth and in interest in income funds and they offer enormous tax efficiencies that you just don't see elsewhere. So that's a key area for your income fund. And for what what, what sort of type of end user? Are we talking about someone who's retired and wants to live on the coupon or for everybody? Well, let's look at the median investor visiting Barron's, for example. It's uh, somebody who's probably 55 years old, I'd say. And, you know, they're looking to retire in maybe 10 years. And I think an income fund there probably makes a lot of sense. And uh, by income fund, um, there's so many different options. So you might focus on master limited partnerships. You might focus on real estate investment with REITs, which um, are often structured as ETFs. You might focus on dividend fund for, funds, for example. And now you have liquid alts, for example, which also uh, many of the top funds there are also income strategy funds. Um, so income funds are really important. I think you'll always have uh, the guys chase, chasing alpha, and that's always going to be there. And I think um, we've discussed this exhaustively here. Obviously, the broad macro points of view and the broad, broad macro funds will always be very interesting. But ultimately, um, you will continue to see in a low rate environment people chasing yield. Yeah. Phil, any thoughts on the kinds of types of strategies that people really need? I agree. Um, you know, truthfully, I think uh, low volatility, reducing drawdowns, and um, you know, generating yield in a very low yield environment are the, probably the three most important uh, factors on the Main Street level right now. So, you know, it, it, as more and more investors are craving yield, uh, it may have the the effect of driving down yields. Mm -hmm. uh, and as more and more product is coming to market, I mean, the industry has responded. Right? There's, you know countless options for, uh, you know, sort of enhanced Zillion yield ETFs, yeah. uh, uh, enhanced yield managed portfolio solutions. Um, there's a reason. This is what investors are, are demanding right now, and it'll be interesting to see what the sort of next generation uh, looks like, truthfully. Okay. I agree. I mean, the older investors want yield products because, you know, they want to be able to get the same result as investing in muni bonds or individual stocks with ETFs. And I think the younger people are looking 20 or 30 years down the line want more long-term, you know, grow my money kind of products. So, but I, in order to get that yield in today's environment, they have to take more risk. Right. So the question is, should they be doing this sort of thing themselves, even using an ETF, or should they turn it over to a managed portfolio uh, that has a particular expertise in managing, uh, managing yield? I think the answer is yes. That's part of what's fueling the growth in the space. So hitting that yield target in a relatively safe manner to you would be one of the ways that these strategists could really deliver deliver the goods for people. Definitely. Um, so, okay, so we've just set out the goals for what people want. People want low volatility strategies. They want income. They don't want to take on too much risk for that income. It all sounds really great. How do you judge these managers? What are the things that you guys would recommend that people look for when they're kicking the tires on them? 
I, I think, um, obviously I'm biased, um, but from a third party perspective, this is what I used to do. Um, I used to run a, a, a fund of funds where we picked managers, so I'm experienced in this. The only thing people should be looking at um, from our perspective is, is a risk return, and not the classic, if you look how Morningstar judges funds, it's, it's very simple. They're star rating. They give you a five star rating if you have a good sharp ratio, essentially. The sharp ratio doesn't show anything because uh, you could have a, a you know, high amount of volatility and still have a high sharp ratio. You could have a high drawdown, very high correlation, very high beta and have a high sharp ratio. So uh, the way I would judge them is, you know, can they outperform in a bad market and can they do fairly well in a, in a good market. So over a long market cycle, do they have lower drawdowns, lower volatility, lower correlation, and can they grow capital? So it's the classic growth chart. You know, you don't want lots of swings, you want a very steady long-term growth. And that to me, from a third party perspective, is what you should be looking for. Depends on the investor though, right? I mean, a 25-year-old investor basically just investing for the first, first time is going to have a very different risk profile than someone who's 70 and, you know, requires stability. So, you know, as the baby boomers get older, there's going to be a massive wealth transfer. It's no secret. Uh, it's happening in the next decade or, or so. Uh, and I think we'll see, uh, you know, the space continue to evolve to reflect the changing demands of the investors just based on the investors themselves changing. I think there are four questions you can ask, um, and there, there, there's some additional as well. The first is, do I understand what this fund is investing in? Is there transparency enough to understand those holdings? The second question is, does this meet my, does this meet my objectives? Does this meet my goals of what I'm trying to accomplish? The third one, and actually I'd start with this one, is risk. What, what is the ultimate risk profile of this fund, and are they able to reduce risk as much as possible? And fourth, what is my best alternative? Is this, are there six holdings here which I can just purchase on my own and it's a pretty set strategy or is, this is a, or is this a complex strategy which reduces my risk where I understand everything that's happening here and I just don't have the time to accomplish on my own? Interesting, good. At this point guys, we have about two minutes left. So what I would like to do is ask you one question and then give you each a chance to say something that you were dying to say that we didn't get to. The first question is, are we gonna see the giant asset managers get into this space? Uh, I think we already have. Vanguard launched a, a managed account uh, feature recently. Personal advisor services, right, that right. one? Uh, yeah, they, they're getting in the space. Um, I think most of these people, are, like any other market, they're gonna be too late. Uh, it's going to be too far along. Um, firms like ours and Good Harbor are going to get too large. Um, and are going to be too too advanced in, from a technology perspective um, in terms of educating clients. Um, you know, I think you know just fr from a high level perspective, you know, fees are going to keep coming down. Uh, it's really going to drive out the need for these large guys. Fidelity doesn't want to charge. 40 basis points. Got it. Unless you guys disagree, you've each got about 20 seconds for a final word. Bill. Uh, I think we're at the very first inning of a massive uh, shift in, in the investment management space in general. The old model is dead. Mutual funds uh, are a thing of the 80s and the 90s, and uh, the way that investors are ultimately going to be buying managed solutions will change uh, again in the next decade. Got it. Mike. This, this trend is one of many which represents the democratization of investment management and the best thing you can do is educate yourself to understand all your options and what you're investing in. Got it. And the other mic? Uh, you know, we think ETFs are awesome, obviously. So uh, you know, <laughs> ETFs are only going to get bigger. Uh, we hope you know, they get as large as possible. We hope mutual funds die. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's really all I have to say because uh, mutual funds just they don't meet the needs of a 2014 investor. Thanks again to our panelists. I hope you found this discussion informative and useful. For more information, you can visit the websites of Market Realist, ETF Issuer Solutions, or Hedgeable, or you can come to the ETF Managed Portfolio Summit in Chicago on June 17th or 18th.